are in a war. The moment you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, repenting of your sins, you are drafted into the conflict of the ages. We have gone into a battle, a war between good and evil, between the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness, between God and Satan. Last week when we were together, we talked about the implications, the cosmic implications of this battle. Uh, if you were with us last week, you will remember that Satan, uh, Lucifer, son of the morning, just this glorious angel for the covering and the keeping of the glory of God, rebelled against God, seeking to take his throne from him. Well, what a fool to think he could overthrow the thrice holy God, and he was cast down out of heaven. His coup failed, and one-third of the angelic hosts were cast down with him. But because he couldn't take God's throne in his glory, he did the next best thing. He decided to co-op God's world by influencing and deceiving God's children, Adam and Eve, stealing their devotion, God's kingdom in this world, and God's glory in this world for himself. And so we watched how that played out last week, but the beautiful part of this story is God's the author of this story. This story called time belongs to him. He is the alpha and the omega, and he wrote Satan into his script as the antagonist, as the enemy, because with the evil that he brings, greater is the glory God receives. And we talked a lot about that last week. I won't reiterate any of that. But what I want to say today is this. Satan couldn't take God's throne. Satan couldn't stop the Christ. Satan couldn't stop the cross, and he knew that at the cross his head was crushed, and his time is short. So Satan only has a short season left before his fate is finally realized. And so now Satan has taken all of his energies, and he has directed them at the heart of Jesus Christ. Because today, Satan's great enemy in this world is the bride of Christ, the church. His energies are now mustered against us, the church of Jesus Christ. And so today, we're going to focus in on the second concept behind these words that uh, the Apostle Paul had given to the Ephesian believers in Ephesians chapter 6. And today, we're, we've gone from the cosmic level last week down to what I would call the local conflict here in Lewiston, Maine, here at Unity Bible Church. Today, we're going to talk about the conflict that's going on right now, whether we're aware of it or not over the life, witness, and future of this church. Let's draw our attention to the scriptures and then let me pray for us. <laughs> Boy, do we need prayer. Here we go. The Apostle Paul wrote these words to the Ephesians. The Holy Spirit has preserved it for us. Hear the word of the Lord. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. And as we looked at last week, that is the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness. Against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Skipping down to verse 17. Take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to this end. Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And also for me, Paul said, that the words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the finished work of Jesus Christ. Again, just entering into this building now, I pray every time we walk through one of these red doors, it would remind us of Jesus and what he accomplished for us on the cross. And when he said it is finished for the people of God, our justification, sanctification, and glorification have all been achieved by the grace of God. Praise your name. But you have left us in this world and we have an enemy 
and you have called us to fight the battle of faith. And so I pray, Father, as we look at the words before us today, that we would not forget that you're sovereign. But on the other hand, let's not forget that we are called by you to fight. So give us wisdom in this battle, I pray. In Jesus' name, and all the people of God said, amen, amen. amen. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a little bit of a look at some of the schemes of the devil that he uses against the church universally, but even us as a local expression of the body of Christ here at Unity. And then we're going to turn our attention to our defensive weapons. How is it that we can fend off these attacks from the devil? So let's begin by looking at this idea called the schemes of the devil in verse 11, the schemes of the devil. Now the word scheme is the Greek word methodia, methodia. On the positive, the word methodia simply means a method. It, it, is, it is a procedure that you do. So the word uh, methodia has a positive meaning, but on the negative side, when it is used in a negative context, as it is here, it refers to devious craftiness. It has the idea of cunning, it has the idea of deception. And so he's saying that we should be able to stand against this cunning, this deception, this, this ongoing craftiness of the devil, his treachery. Now, we're given some indication as to what this looks like right here in the scriptures. So we have the birth of the church in the book of Acts. So in Acts chapter 2, let's just do a quick little perusal of some of the book of Acts so that we can see how the devil works, so we can be aware and wise to his schemes. So in Acts chapter 2, again, we have what's called the birth of the church. On the day of Pentecost, the apostle Peter stood up during this great feast day and he proclaimed Jesus Christ. He was the Messiah. He came, lived a perfect life. He died on the cross and rose again. And the apostle Peter said this, he said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and for your children and for all who are afar off. That includes us, everyone whom the Lord our God, God has called to himself. And it says in Acts chapter 2 that 3,000 people came to Jesus that day. And all God's people said, Amen. oh, it was a miracle of God. He brought the church to life right in that day, on that moment. And so now we have this, this group of people who are now followers of Jesus, the bride of Christ. And it says just a little further down in verse 47, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. It was growing. It was exciting. This was amazing. God was doing a work. And you get to chapter 4 and verse 4, you see it goes on to say these words. It says, and many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men alone now numbered 5,000. So we went from 3,000 on the day of Pentecost to just a short time later, just the men, more than 5,000 people, were now followers of Jesus Christ. And it's now that the devil starts to show up. It's now that Satan is angry. Christ defeated him at the cross. There's nothing he can do now except pour out his fury, his anger on the bride of Christ. And so in Acts chapter 4, we see Satan coming against the church as a roaring lion, as he breathed out threats against the believers through the religious leaders. So here comes Satan, and he's breathing out threats. They had arrested some of the disciples, and they pulled them before this, this court of men, and they said, you can no longer speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus screaming at them, threatening them, don't ever speak in his name again. And the believers started to pull back. This was scary. Have you ever heard a lion roar? It's a scary thing. Your tendency is to flee. And so the disciples were roared at through these religious leaders, and they were afraid. They had drawn back. And it says in chapter 4, it says that... Um, 
they, they gather together and, and they turn to prayer and they said this, O oh, sovereign Lord, who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father, your servant said through the Holy Spirit, why do the nations, why do the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth have set themselves and their rulers to gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed with Herod and Pontius Pilate and all the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Notice the sovereignty of God. They saw God doing what God was doing and they even saw the death of Christ as part of God's plan, using evil people to do it. And now they turn to God in prayer. And it says this, and when they had prayed, the place where they gathered together was shaking and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Satan came in as a roaring lion, threatening them. They pulled back. They prayed to their sovereign God, and he said, keep going. So he comes at us like a roaring lion. And again, it says in chapter 5, it says, And more than ever, the believers were added to the Lord multitudes of both men and women. The church was growing. It was just busting at the seams. And so Satan came again in Acts chapter 5 as the lying serpent through Ananias and Sapphira trying to create hypocrisy in the church. And so they came in and said, yes, we gave our full offering to the Lord. And Peter pulled him aside and said, Ananias, why is it that Satan has filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, it, it, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it still not at your disposal? Then why have you contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. And he died right on the spot. Whoa. God said, no, Satan, you're not going to get into the church through the lying of these people. And then, of course, his wife comes along not knowing that her husband had already killed over dead. And she, she agreed with a lie, and she was killed too. Can I just say, from that day forward, the people of God have never cheated God in the offering plate. <laughs> oh, well, maybe not. Okay, so keep going here. So, so Satan came as a roaring lion, and God shook the house, and they became more bold. He came at them as a lying serpent. And he smote them dead, and, and great fear fell upon all the people. And so the church continued to grow. You get to chapter uh, 6, and you see this. And the word continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and great many of the priests were now becoming obedient to the faith. The church was continuing to grow, continuing to march. And it says, now Satan came as the accuser of the brethren in chapter 6. He was seeking to create division in the church. It said, uh, again, when those days were there, the disciples were increasing number and a complaint. Oh, here we go. By the Hellenists, who are the, the Greek speakers, against the Hebrews, because their widows seem to be, uh, the, the Grecian widows seem to be neglected in the daily distribution of the food. And so now Satan's coming in, trying to create division between this group and that group, an ethnic division within the church. And it was at this point the disciples pulled back and they said, whoa, 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 wait a minute, this is not any good. So at this point they raised up a group of men called deacons. And these deacons became the servants of the church to make sure the dispensation was done well. And this is what it says, and don't forget this because we'll camp on this in just a minute. He said, but we, the apostles, will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And again, Satan was beaten back. So Satan came as a lion through, through the threats of the religious leaders. He came as a lying serpent through Ananias and Sapphira sowing lies. He came as the accuser of the brethren. By the way, that's what the name devil means. The word devil means accuser. And this is what he was doing. And the word of God continued. And it increased and it increased. And so in Acts chapter 8, he came as the murderer. And in Acts chapter 7, we have the story of Stephen. And Stephen, eloquent about the truth of Israel and the truth of God and the truth of Jesus Christ. And they became so enraged that they murdered Stephen. 
And the man sitting, standing there con, uh, agreeing with this murder was a man by the name of Saul of Tarsus. In chapter 8, it says that Saul ravaged the church and he went from house to house, dragging off men and women and committing them to prison. And so if he couldn't stop them with a roar, he couldn't stop them with a hiss, he couldn't stop them with an accusation, he was now going to kill them. And in Acts chapter 12, James and Peter are arrested. And Herod has James killed and the people rejoiced and he was about to have Peter killed as well. So welcome to the schemes of the devil. He is actively at work trying to destroy the bride of Jesus Christ. And so too, he's actively at work today trying to destroy the church in our desire of devotion to Jesus Christ. And so if you look at how Satan tends to operate, he tends to operate basically in one of two ways, or both ways, depending on, on the congregation or the church. One of the ways he tends to work is his desire is to destroy the church from the outside. From the outside. And one of the ways he does that is through open persecution. Uh, we see this all around the world with our brothers and sisters and many foreign lands. They are beset by the authorities, by thugs, by other religions, and they are murdered in mass. Uh, right now, I think it's Nigeria is the country where there's an, an incredible number of believers who are being martyred right now. In North, in North Korea, China, um, all around the world, Satan uses open persecution and martyrdom to discourage the church. Not so much here. Today, what Satan tends to do more cunningly to those of us who are in the West, in America in particular, is he comes to us with deceptive distractions from the outside. There's a man by the name of C.S. Lewis. Ever heard of him? Yeah, great thinker, great thinker. He wrote a book called The Screwtape Letters. I don't know if you're familiar with it or not. Uh, in the book Screwtape Letters, uh, he creates a fictional dialogue between a senior tempter by the name of Screwtape, uh, a demon, and his junior nephew demon named Wormwood. Now, the older demon is telling the younger demon how it is that he, they're gonna keep the patient, a Christian, from, from glorifying God, from living effectively for the Lord. And so this was written, listen, in 1942. But hear how relevant it is to write now. Dear Wormwood, we want very much to make men treat Christianity as a means to an end. Preferably, of course, as a means to their own advancement, Health, wealth, prosperity, gospel, by the way. Okay, let's keep moving. But failing that as any means to anything, even social justice. Curious. The thing to do is to get a man at first to value social justice as a thing which the enemy, God, demands of them. And then work him to the stage at which he values Christianity because it will be able to produce social justice. For the enemy will not be used as a convenience. Men or nations who think that they can revive the faith in order to make a good society <laughs> might as well think that they could use the stairs of heaven as a shortcut to the nearest chemistry shop. Fortunately, it's quite easy to coax humans around this little corner. 1942, he wrote that. He could have written that this week. And it would not have been any more relevant than it is today. This is one of the ploys of Satan against the church today. It is part of his deception, part of his distractions for the, what the church is really called to do. And it is the distraction of social justice today. The, the whole BLM, the critical race theory, the intersectionality, everything. Get involved in everything. But the one thing for which the church was created, which is to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and to grow God's people to look like Jesus Christ. But don't do that. Do everything else. Change the culture. But that's not why we're here. That's not why we're here. But that's what he says. Oh, look, a march. Oh, look, a protest. Oh, look, a rally. Oh, look, an election. 
Ooh, 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 something shiny, something bright. Let's go over here and do this. We, 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 are, we are so easily distracted today. Where do those come from? Our enemy who is trying to take the attention of the church off our mission and off the person of Jesus Christ and get it down to this plane and saying it's our mission to change that. No, that's not our mission. The devil is subtle and he is distracting the church to death. Do you not hear the sss behind all of this? It is Satan and he is doing what he does. He is manipulating and distracting the church from the very purposes for which Christ gave it life. So that is one of the ways he tries to destroy the church is from the outside. He'll do it through open persecution and the day will come. The day will come for us in America as well, open persecution. But until then, he's very deceptive around the edges, just distracting us from what we really are meant to be about. The second way, and I think even more insidious, is he tries to destroy the church from the inside. From the inside. He slithers his way inside the church and he insidiously defiles her from the inside. You know, uh, one of the ways he does that is by planting in the church false believers. You know, Jesus gave us this parable. It comes from Matthew chapter 13. There's a whole bunch of parables of the kingdom here. Uh, but in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 24, Jesus gave a parable. The kingdom of heaven, it may be compared to a man who sows good seed in the field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also, and the servants of the master of the house said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? And he said to them, an enemy has done this. A little further down, he explains this parable, parable for his disciples. In, in verse 38, he said, the weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy is the one who sowed them is the devil. So part of Satan's ploy to de destroy the church, to defile the bride of Christ, is to sow into Christendom, churches, false believers. It, it is what he does. Do you know today, uh, if you were to go to Google and say, what is the largest religion in the world? It would pop up Christianity. Christianity is the largest religion in the world with as many as 2.4 billion adherents. And it's awful easy to get very proud about that. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, we're really doing our job. Well, yes, we seem to be really on the top of this. No, oh, no, no, no. A vast majority of those under the uh, umbrella of Christendom, then that includes soup to nuts. A vast majority are people who are religious, who are trying to do good works to win the favor of God that maybe somehow he will shine his face on them. These aren't the true followers of Christ. You know, way back in Israel's day, uh, Israel was called the people of God. They were an entire nation of people. And yet, it was very clear that there was ever only a remnant of them that were true believers. Do you know what a remnant is? A remnant is that little piece you cut off the end of a larger part. And friends, under Christendom today, in Christianity today, there's only a remnant. There's really only a remnant of true believers. The rest are, are false. The, the rest are deceived. The rest are, are just not his. And, and so he sows false believers to try and in, in, uh, defile the church. And then secondly, he brings false teachers to the church. Uh, Paul, uh, when he was meeting with the Ephesian elders as he was getting ready to go to Jerusalem where he would be arrested and wind up in Rome and then write the book of Ephesians. But on his way, he called the Ephesian elders to himself and he said this, Ephesians 20, verse 28, pay careful attention to yourselves, elders, gentlemen, that's us. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will even arise men speaking twisted things. The idea is corrupt or perverted things and draw away the disciples 
after them. And, and so here is another way in which Satan works. He sows false believers and then he brings false teachers to the church. And in so doing, he defiles the bride of Jesus Christ. You know, today, um, one of the ways that Satan has manipulated many pastors, many churches today, in the evangelical circles that we like to say we involve, evolve ourselves. By the way, the word evangelical comes from the word evangel, the gospel. And evangelical churches are those that value the gospel and believe other people need to hear the gospel. So that, that's a good thing. But many evangelical churches today have, have kind of moved into what's called the seeker-friendly movement. The seeker-friendly movement. And they've done this under the guise of evangelism. If we just tear down any distinction that the church has and invite the whole world to join us on a Sunday morning, then, then what, there's a good chance some unbelievers might be in the room and then, then they might get saved. And so they do this with, quote-unquote, good intentions of, of evangelizing. But, but really, a lot of this, and I've run in some of these circles, and I've actually participated in a lot of this in my, my past, uh, a lot of this on a human level often ends up being human ego. It's about human kingdoms. It's about me building my ministry and it's about my buildings and my budget and, and, and look at my church. I've seen so much of that and it's so disgusting. And then on a spiritual wickedness level, what, it is about Satan trying to defile, to sully, to dirty the bride of Christ. There's a man by the name of Paul Washer who I think says it very well. Listen to what he has to say. There was a great king who loved his bride. Oh, he loved her. And he always dressed her in the simplest yet most elegant white linen. She needed no audacious colors on her face. She needed no wild hairdos. She was beautiful, simple, elegant, pure, godly, beautiful. One day this king goes on a long journey and he calls you as a steward. He says, I'm going to entrust my bride to you. I'm going to be going. I've laid out for you in a book every rule I want you to maintain. I want nothing changed, nothing changed. Steward, you be faithful to carry out this book. Well, the king goes and he's been away a long time long time and all of a sudden the steward begins to realize that the people in the kingdom are, are no they're losing interest in the king because they're losing interest in the bride she's too simple um, too prudish rather boring she's out of step with the times and so this steward thinks in his mind, aha, I've got it figured out. He calls her in. He takes off her white, elegant, godly dress and dresses her in something far more attractive to carnal men. Paints her face and then parades her up and down the street. And by doing so, draws all the carnal, wicked men back into fellowship, supposedly with the king. That's exactly what countless pastors in America are doing today. They have taken the simplicity of the bride of Christ, her magnificent beauty, her purity, her holiness, and they have tore it from her and they dress her up and parade her in front of carnal men that they will be attracted to somehow come back to God. Let me tell you something. On the day of judgment, don't, don't worry about the atheist. Don't fear for the prostitute or the murderer. You want to fear for somebody on the day of judgment? You fear for a large number of evangelical pastors who have departed from the Word of God and are parading the church in a dress, a garb that God never intended her to wear. Many times I pray, Lord, increase your fear in me. Increase your fear in me.
You should be afraid to touch my wife, terribly afraid. Oh, but how much more afraid should you be to touch the bride of Christ and do anything with her that is not found in this book? Satan hates the church. And he has done an amazing job of manipulating the church and sowing false believers into the church and sowing false teachers into the church. And he has sullied the bride of Christ. He has made her dirty looking because he hates Jesus. And he knows that his day is coming where he will be damned. So he's doing everything within his power to try and manipulate, to defile, and if need be, destroy the church. And so the question becomes, well, well, how do we stop this? How do we stop this? We're commanded here with the Apostle Paul's words that we are to stand against the schemes of the devil. And he goes on to say that we are to stand against these rulers who are manipulating the masses, to stand against these authorities that are sowing these things to the church, to stand against these cosmic powers over this present darkness, to stand against these spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. He says that enough, you can stand against the schemes of the evil one. And there's only one way. Take up the whole armor of God. That you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Next week, when we get together, we're going to move from the cosmic last week, from the local this week, to the personal next week. Next week, we're going to talk about personal wrestling with Satan. And we're going to look at the armor very detailed wise. I want to just give you this little heads up that I found encouraging as I thought about this. The armor that Jesus, the armor that Paul tells us about, according to Isaiah, the prophet, is the same armor that Yahweh wore when he defeated Satan at the throne. It's the same armor that the Messiah won when he defeated Satan at the cross. And it's that same battle-tested armor that we are offered to wear as believers today. So next week, we're going to talk about what that armor really looks like. As we finish this morning, I just want to focus in on two pieces. And that is the sword of the Spirit and praying in the Spirit. The sword of the spirit and praying in the spirit. Remember, when Satan came against the church to create division, the apostles said, we're going to put some deacons in place, make sure people's needs are met, but we're going to commit ourselves to prayer and the word of God. That's how the early church was able to stand against the schemes of the devil. It was by prayer and dependence on God, and it was by standing in the truth of God. And so it is these two things that are the primary weapons of the local church in order for us to not be overwhelmed by the schemes of the devil. And just briefly, I I just want to talk about these briefly. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. That you present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable act of worship, by the way. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may be able to prove what is the acceptable and perfect will of God. And the only way that you can renew your mind to keep it from being conformed by the culture is to take the truth of Scripture and to embed it into your mind. The key to the church, the key to the individual believer's life is something called doctrine. 
doctrine. And in our world today, oh, doctrine divides, doctrine divides. No, doctrine defends, doctrine defends against many of the schemes of the evil one. You know, th this, is, this is so good. Go to Ephesians. If you have Ephesians open, you, maybe you do, maybe you don't. Maybe I put too much stuff up here. Maybe we'll do away with this from now on. We'll just use the Bibles. What do you think? All right, well, maybe we'll figure this out. But I just want to say this. I want to show you how the Apostle Paul in Ephesians, notice what he does. He gives us Ephesians chapter 1, 2, and 3, which deals with doctrine. God the Father chose us in eternity past, and, and he, he elected us to be his children and predestined us to adoption. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came 2,000 years ago, lived our life, died our death under the wrath and judgment of God, rose again, and he did that to secure our redemption and forgiveness. And then he brought the Holy Spirit into our lives as we were living our lives, and we were quickened together with Jesus Christ, and so we were born again. All of that is a God. All of that is by grace. And then he gets to chapter four. And he says this to me. Chapter four, verse 11. Shepherd, teacher, my gift to the local church. Shepherd, teachers, equip the saints for the work of ministry. What does that even mean? So that you can build up the body of God. No, until we all attain to the unity of the faith. The faith is the content of faith. The scriptures, the doctrines of the, the truth of word, God's word. Help the people of God to come to the unity of the faith. That is the knowledge of the Son of God. Doctrine. To mature manhood. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So that we may no longer be children who are tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine. By human cunning and craftiness. Deceitful schemes. My job before God and this congregation is to train you in the teaching of doctrine so that you know God, that you know the faith, that you understand how to stand in the day that's evil. This is so important. And as you get it, what happens is all of a sudden now you start to walk in a manner worthy of your calling. You're no longer being conformed by the world. You're now being shaped by the word of God. And you are now those who no longer walk like the Gentiles, Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They were darkened in their understanding. But now we have the truth of Jesus and we put off the old self and we put on the new self. And we're looking totally different. We're now walking in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us. We're now walking as children of the light in this very dark world, doing good and knowing right discerning what is pleasing to the Lord. And we look carefully on how we are to walk, not as unwise, but as wise, because the days are evil. And we submit women to our husbands. Well, men, we love our wives as Christ loved the church. Children, submit to their parents. Parents, love your children and teach them in the ways of Christ. Employers, submit to your employ employer. Employees, submit to your employee. Employer, te treat your workers well. So we're radically different people. But what happens when doctrine doesn't take root in people's lives? is this doesn't happen. And it speaks of the culture we live in today. It's a church devoid of truth today. In fact, um, getting ready for this, and I'll just put this up. Uh, how many of you are familiar with Ligonier Ministries? Yes, well, Ligonier Ministries does a survey every year on the theological temperature uh, of America. They're trying to figure out what's going on. And so they do a large scale uh, poll. And then out of that large scale poll, there's always a group of people who identify themselves as evangelicals, people who believe in Jesus. And so I found the results very telling. Here we go. Here's one of the questions. God accepts the worship of all religions, including Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. So the orange represents people in light of you know, just the world, but the gray represents the evangelical. So if you look at this, what it's saying is those who aren't sure, those who think they agree, and those who do agree, that 51% of people who identify as evangelicals say, yes, God accepts the worship of all religions. Now you should be sitting there horrified by this concept. There's only one true and living God, and his name is not Allah. There's only one and true and living God, and he is in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and he seeks worshipers who worship him in spirit and in, that's it. All the rest are worshiping the God of this world. 
who co-opted this world from God to take the glory for himself. So they think they're worshiping the one true God, but they aren't. God's people should know this. Too many don't. There's a lack of understanding, a lack of teaching. Uh, it goes on. <laughs> Too long. <clears throat> Jesus is the first and greatest created uh, being of God. 71% of those who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ believe that he is a created being of God. Now, this is an old heresy that was dealt with at the Nicene Council in the 4th century called Arianism. And there it was considered to be outside of orthodoxy. No, Jesus Christ is co-equal with God the Father. And yet, this, this, is, this, is, what, this is what the JWs believe. So 71% of the evangelical church are more JW than they are evangelical. What is this? So all I'm saying is, is that there's a lack of doctrine. There's a lack of understanding, a lack of teaching. And then again, you know, Jesus was a good teacher, but he was not God. Listen, I found this stupefying. 34% of those who call themselves evangelicals don't even believe Jesus is God. Yeah. Doesn't that make, that almost makes you want to wretch. <laughs> I'm sorry. If you know the truth, you're like, what are you thinking? Not much. You know, Ravi Zacharias, the great, the great apologist of our age, said this. People today now, people today hear with their eyes and they think with their hearts. People don't know the truth. It's, it's part of the age we live in. I could go on and on. You know, the Holy Spirit is a force, but is not a personal being. 56% of those who responded said that the Holy Spirit isn't even a real uh, being of the Trinity. Uh, again, every little, everyone sins a little, but most people are good by nature. 51% believe that most people are by nature good. It, it, first thing I thought of was those words by John MacArthur. The damned think they're good. The saved know they're wicked. <laughs> I mean, there's just truth in that. If you don't know your own depravity, then you don't understand Jesus. You don't understand the cross. You don't understand why that's even necessary. Um, and then again, um, even the smallest sin deserves eternal damnation. 50% uh, said no. No, we're born lost. It's not like you find your way to lostness. We're born that way, on our way to hell, and it's only if Jesus intersects us that that is somehow stopped, all by the grace of God. So all that to say this, my job before God is to teach doctrine. It is yours to absorb it, to learn it, to grow in it, to become like Jesus Christ, mature in him. And your lives are no longer short, shaped and formed by the culture, but it's shaped and formed by the word of God. And we start to look distinct and unique and different than the world around us. But when this happens, Paul wrote Timothy. Timothy was his young protege who later would become the pastor in Ephesus. And he said this, his last letter before he was uh, put to death. The apostle Paul said this, understand this, Timothy. In the last days, there will come times of difficulty for the people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to the parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving, good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having an appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Always learning, but never able to arrive at the knowledge of the truth. And he's talking about the church. That's why the world looks like it looks today. This is why the world looks like it looks today. Because the church has been wholly overrun by the world. The church is meant to be distinct from the world. We are, I, I'm sorry, this is not good to say in these days. We are exclusive. We just are. The church is only those who have, who have come to Jesus Christ by repentance and faith and have embraced him with their lives. They give testimony to this fact and they are baptized and then they enter into a covenant agreement with the other believers in a local assembly saying, this is not my life, it's yours. I'm here to serve. I love you. This is the church. It is not, let's pull down every uniqueness, every distinction, pull down all the things, drop the, drop the gate over the moat, and welcome the world in so we might win a few people to Jesus. And we are reaping that today. Do you know what Paul's answer to this problem was to Timothy? Listen. Oh, just so, you, shame on you. 
<laughs> Paul said this, chapter 4, 2 Timothy, and this is his last words. And he wanted to make sure he heard him. I charge you, Timothy, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom. He's saying, I charge you in light of that. Preach the word. In season, out of season, all the time. I want you to be quick to reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. Because the time is coming where people will not endure sound doctrine. But having itching ears, they will accumulate to themselves teachers who suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Satan's good at what he does. He has deceived so many. And we as a church need to be careful to make sure that we teach and understand and grow in the truth of God together. Because only then will we ultimately take on lives that can honor the Lord and fend off the attacks of Satan in our personal lives and as a church. What time is it? Oh, I've got an hour yet. This is so good. No, I don't. All that to say this. Uh, next week, we're going to start with New City Catechism. New City Catechism. I, want, I would like you to go to your app store. Most of us have a, uh, a cell phone, uh, a smartphone. Go to your app store and download the New City Catechism, please. Next week, we will start using this. It will go for 52 weeks. And uh, each of these catechism is, is designed to give us doctrine. And, and doctrine gives us a file folder for truth. Does that make sense? You see, a lot of us hear a lot of things, and our minds are a bit like a file cabinet. If you don't actually have a place with a, a name on the folder to drop the truth into, most of it just falls on the ground. A lot of us have a lot of stuff. It's, it's kind of all at the foot of our mind. We don't really know how it all adds up. This will actually give us categories of truth, of understanding, so when I speak on a Sunday morning or something happens, you're going to go, oh my God, that fits there. That's so cool. Because you now have a, a framework for that, a file folder for that. This is what this does. It gives us doctrine, categories of doctrine, so that we can understand and take these things on. So we're going to be doing that. Let me get beyond Tim. Bye, Tim. Um, and, and then um, in two weeks, uh, when we're done with the study next week, we're going to start a series called Habakkuk. And in this book, a series is only going to be four weeks long, but we're going to look at when God seems unfair. Why, God, is there so much injustice and you don't do anything about it? Does that sound like today? We're going to talk about that and we're going to go through the book together to learn the truths of God's word. That's what expository preaching is about. It's about understanding the truth of God in its context. You know, the Bible contains everything necessary for life and godliness. Is there anything we need more than the teachings of God's word? The only answer I could give to that is maybe, goodbye, maybe praying in the spirit. I know a lot of people who know a lot of truth and they're as cold and dead as this thing is. Truth can just cause you to blow away because you know it all. The thing that keeps you supple in the hands of God. The word of God informs your head, but praying in the spirit will transform our hearts. And this is not just praying, it's praying in the spirit. And I don't think it's a reference to tongues as Corinthians refers to it, but I think it's an acknowledgement of our utter dependence on God and a growing love for him. Again, the father is looking for worshipers, those who worship him in spirit and in truth. And so I think God longs for us to be in his presence, acknowledging our dependence on him and not just that we know it all. In the balance will keep us ready for the battle. Ready for the battle. Amen. The church in Revelation. Uh, church in Ephesus, Revelation chapter 2. I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance, and I know you cannot bear with those who are evil and have tested those who call themselves apostles and aren't and have found a faults. I know your endurance uh, how you bear up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. 
you're good at truth. You flesh those guys right out and run them out of town. But I have something against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. If you aren't praying, you lose that love. It is the spirit, the word of the sword of the spirit, and it is the praying in the spirit. Those are the keys for the local church to remain on task for the Lord. And again, we are going to move our Wednesday evenings from a Bible study to a prayer meeting, but we will still study the scriptures. So this Wednesday evening, we're going to start reading the book of Acts together, understanding the teaching of God in the early church. We're going to read verse by verse, make our way through, and help the people of God uh, encourage one another along these lines. All right, let me just finish with this. Oh, there's so much. If Christ has already won the victory, then why are we still fighting? If Christ has already won the victory, why are we still fighting? Why does God allow the devil to attack us? Martin Luther put it like this, in a mighty fortress is our God. God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. God defeated the devil for us, and now he is defeating him through us. And in the process, he is using the devil to make us like Jesus. You know, the devil thinks he's destroying us, and God says, oh, no, you're not. You are just refining my people. You are just polishing my people to make them look more and more like Jesus. I think if we prayed that, you know, Lord, bring on the devil so he can polish us. I think he'll stay away. <laughs> he doesn't want to do that. He wants to, he doesn't want anything to do with glorifying God. And yet, that's why he's still at work in our lives. Um, this last quote, I'll pray. Uh, and then Marcel, come on up. We're going to close with a song. Um, William Hendrickson said this, God has willed that those who are his are to walk the narrow road of battle on our way home. And it is to those who overcome, he gives the victor's crown. To those who overcome, he gives the victor's crown. Father, thank you uh, for your grace. It saves us, it keeps us, and ultimately it will deliver us from this present evil darkness. In the meanwhile, help us to focus on your word to know you. That's why we do this. It's not just to know words or to have, have teaching. It's to know you, to know the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. In the first century, you forced your people under their knees through persecution. Maybe that's what it takes for us. I don't know. I hope not. But teach us to pray. Make us supple. Make us ready. Help us to be good soldiers in this battle. Father, we love you. Thank you. In Jesus' name.